The air is soft and warm. We've just started a 600-mile river journey that you could either call a pilgrimage or a post-mortem on time long past. We're passing palm trees and mud hut villages, sugar plantations, and a panorama that hasn't changed in any of its essentials in 5,000 years. Caesar would have recognized that helmsman's features. Mark Antony would have seen hundreds of such like felucas carrying sugar cane and cotton, for we're navigating the world's most historic river. The Nile, with its rich silt and yearly flooding, carved the start of Western culture out of the desert, and the ancient kings who grew rich on the gifts of the Nile, in turn, carved massive memorials out of its rose-tinted stone. Luxor Temple, where Ramesses left his huge monuments to dwarf us and the centuries to near insignificance. This was Thebes, imperial city of the pharaohs for a thousand years, in such great temples, the sun god, Amun-Ra, was worshipped for longer than the whole of our Christian epoch. In fact, you'll find on this journey up the Nile, the sun still has its dedicated devotees. For centuries, tomb robbers scoured the Nile Valley, rifling the sepulchres, and in the Middle Ages, even grinding mummies to a powder that was sold as medicine. And waves of religious fanatics systematically defaced whatever ancient monuments they came across to blot out the idolatry of these pre-Christian beliefs. The wonder is that anything so unspoilt as this temple at Edfu could escape their destructive zeal. The early Coptic Christians would have obliterated Horus the Hawk, son of Azaris, the god of the dead, if they'd unearthed this ancient place, but many of the treasures of the Nile lay undiscovered until the turn of the last century, when Egyptology really began. Now, passengers on the riverboat can recapture the whole grandeur in easy stages and see from vivid records how the pharaohs lived. You can go on from here to where the Nile cascades through a great cataract and farther in a 10-day scheduled trip which once only the leisured few could enjoy. This is the winter scene on the great, wide, winding waterway after the June floods have run riot and the dam sluice gates have been shut to regulate the flow. There's a scurrying aboard, for this is the season when the steamer can edge in and disembark visitors on the clay bank here at Kamombo, so they can see one of the last temples of the Upper Nile that isn't threatened with flooding when the big new dam is built just upriver at Aswan. Here you can see carvings and fine friezes which the warrior kings had ordered in their honor. In some places, they're colored white from lime, blue from azurite, and red from the iron in the surrounding rocks. Nubia, and now the backcloth is empty and scrubland. Here's the dry land that will be buried deep underwater, along with a score of temples ages older than Methuselah. These sphinxes at Wadi El Sebar, which became water animals when the first dam was built, will be moved together with the temple when the new, bigger one is there. But there are others which may disappear and disintegrate. It matters perhaps little that such trim villages will crumble deep below the waterline of the world's biggest man-made lake. The whole of Egypt will prosper from the power and the fertility that the new dam will hold in store. Three new palm trees will grow for every one that is drowned. The ducks will find new reeds to rest in. It matters little if a few tombs and temples are lost in the flood. Their hieroglyphics and wall pictures have been read and recorded, and their contribution to history has been made. But there is one threatened place whose loss would leave the world impoverished, 
You reach it, if you can contrive to do so, at sunrise. Abu Simbel. The rock temple, built again by the pharaoh Ramesses, was carved out of the sandstone face of the cliffs. This temple was built so that the rising sun would shine direct into the inner sanctuary of the gods and light the face of the pharaoh Ramesses once a year. By the side of the towering pharaoh, even his favorite queen was of small significance not reaching much more stature than the hordes of Asiatic prisoners depicted under his mighty feet. The two Nile gods bind the symbolic plants of Upper and Lower Egypt, united by this proud warrior, the achievement which prompted Ramesses to carve the facade of this temple out of a 250-foot hillside, with those seated figures of him more than 12 times larger than life. Saving it calls for a project greater still, one costly plan is to cut it loose from the cliff and inch it onto a series of concrete slabs, together with Queen Nefertari's own boudoir temple alongside. Look at the young queen, and it's hard to realize all this was built as long before Christ as St. Paul's Cathedral was built after him. So fresh and young and modern does this girl queen look. The river of Egypt truly has many hidden secrets. So look now with wonderment at Abu Simbel, lest any hope of saving it is abandoned, and in a few years, these treasures too are hidden irrevocably by the waters of the Nile. <laughs>